Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley here in Washington. I'd like to call your attention briefly to uh, my book, Surviving the Cataclysm, Your Guide Through the Greatest Financial Crisis in Human History. The long-awaited second edition is available from Amazon.com and from Progressive Press. Dot com. Please order multiple copies of Surviving the Cataclysm. We're going to illustrate one of the chapters uh, later on in the program. Also, Obama the Postmodern Coup, The Making of a Manchurian Candidate. If you want to know what a color revolution is, a CIA people power coup or velvet revolution, you can do no better than to get that book and read it. Uh, distinguished essay in there by Jonathan Mawat on the color revolutions and how the Obama campaign itself borrowed so many of the elements of the color revolution, the telegenic demagogue, that seems to be one of the places where the Iranian coup has fallen down. And generally speaking, the, uh, the people power coup only works if there's no organized opposition. We've seen that repeatedly. Some place like Lebanon where you have a big uh, Hezbollah organization fighting you, the thing becomes much harder. Similarly, today in, uh, in Iran, You've also got Barack H. Obama, the unauthorized biography. Uh, today we've got, uh, if you look at the American Thinker, a, uh, a right-wing uh, website, we've got a, an essay by uh, a lady of Nigerian background, L.E. Echinga, uh, of a Nigerian uh, background living here in the United States, and she goes through the cultural identity of, uh, of Obama as a feature of uh, post-colonial British colonies in Africa and Obama's obsession with his father. <clears throat> this is all fine, except when she gets to the point of saying Obama embraced Marxism. Obama never embraced Marxism. What he embraced is France Fanon, which is not Marx. It is much worse, absolutely much worse. That is to say, France Fanon, a follower of Nietzsche and Sorel, of uh, purgative violence, big influence on Mussolini, but Fanon t goes back to Nietzsche, to Sorel, and he preaches the idea that anti-colonial struggle has to be accompanied by as much violence as possible because the civilization of Europe and even more of the United States is demonic. This is worse than uh, Marxism. Obviously, the Communist Party of the U.S., very poor theoretical development, was eager to cater, to opportunistically pander to uh, this kind of Fanon stuff. Uh, and again, the ideology of Bill Ayers and Bernadine Dorn, they're, they are Obama's best friends. If you asked Obama, who's your best friend, the honest answer would be Bill Ayers. This is what they preach. You can see their... Uh, latest book, Race Course, where they give a kind of watered-down version of Fanon. The weatherman SDS ideology of Ayers and Dorn is there has to be a race war in which much of the U.S. will be destroyed but will come out of it uh, purged finally of the original sins of racism and slavery. This is a bad, bad scene. So don't call Obama a Marxist. You're helping him with that. Marxism uh, does not pack the punch that it used to. That accusation would have been uh, fairly uh, effective in the 1950s, maybe into the 60s, but that's long gone. So forget about Obama as a Marxist. He is a Fanonist uh, third world um, uh, uh, acolyte. He's a, a weatherman. His ideology is that of the weatherman. In other words, as some have mentioned, Obama is Bill Ayers, yes, in, in the White House. A weatherman in the White House, an unbelievable situation. But to call that Marxism leads you in precisely the wrong direction. You can read all about this in Obama, the unauthorized biography. So those, those three at the moment. I'd also like to recommend for people uh, the Obama deception. Uh, Alex Jones uh, yesterday gave uh, a report on his program about the tremendous progress of the Obama deception. Uh, 15, 20 million views certainly translated into a dozen languages, including the big ones, right, the Chinese, Japanese, uh, Spanish, uh, German, French, Italian, uh, Russian, uh, Arabic, I think. Uh, it's available virtually to, to well, to vast majority of the population of the world can now look at this. So uh, get your copy of Ob the Obama deception. I have a, a humble contribution to this. And let's not forget uh, Larry Sinclair, Larry Sinclair's book about Obama, 
uh, entitled um, Sex, Lies, Cocaine, and Murder. You can get Larry Sinclair's book from uh, Barnes & Noble. You can pre-order it there, or maybe that has switched over into direct order. Now, let's go back to, uh, to cap and trade. This is, this is nothing short of national suicide. Remember, the problem in the Depression is that you got too much paper capital, you got too many fictitious claims on the income from production, and you got way too little production in terms of capital goods production, in uh, heavy uh, industrial investment in particular. The U.S., uh, as we've noted, is now below 10 million productive workers in factories. Uh, so this is the problem we have. Now, what does the cap and trade do? It, it makes it worse. It's exactly the opposite of what you sh we should be doing, because on the one side, it creates a speculative market in these carbon offsets where the hedge funds and the Goldman Sachs of the world will go in and drive up those prices in a speculative manner, imposing an unlimited, theoretically unlimited tax on real production. There's some talk coming from the supporters of this bill, the bill in question, H.R. 2454. That's the one you've got to stop. H.R. 2454, call in right now. Tell them, stop it. No, no way. Nix, uh, don't do it. Uh, pull back from this. This is the leap into the abyss. Uh, it imposes a tax on real production. It won't affect, uh, you know, Wall Street uh, banks because their, their carbon footprint is minimal. But anybody who's producing anything will get slammed, and there's no limit to the amount of slam. It, there's also no limit to the amount that you as an individual will pay for heating oil, for gasoline, for your car, for kerosene, for propane, any other uses you have. All of that is going to get slammed. And, again, there's no limit. It's not that the government is going to say, you know, you pay 15 percent. It's that this is now delivered into the hands of a speculative market where they can bid it up, uh, doing to these carbon offsets what Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and a phalanx of hedge funds did to the price of oil during 2008. This is Al Gore. This is Malthus. Malthus, of course, a plagiarist of Gian Maria Ortes, and it's the uh, typical – uh, well, it's it's the race science of our time, uh, the, the idea of global warming, as uh, Obama said the other day, the debate is over. The debate is not over. The debate is lively. The debate is increasing because the discrediting of the uh, charlatans of climatology who have been created in particular to sell this particular piece of obscurantism and irrationalism, these people are on the defensive. Uh, as it becomes more and more more clear that it is solar activity which is at work here, right? The parallels to events on other planets in the solar system where similar temperature rises are observed. And then my specialty, the historical argument, of course, is that we're well within the band of oscillation that we've seen with written records. Now, written records over the past thousand years, if you go from the uh, period of the medieval warm period 1000 A.D., 1100 A.D., uh, Eric the Red, Leif Erikson, you know the drill, uh, Vineland, grapes growing in Newfoundland, grapes growing perhaps in Iceland, grapes growing in Norway. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, uh, but that was, uh, that was then, and it's obvious that the polar bears somehow made it through the medieval warm period. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any polar bears, would there? And then contrast that to the little ice age that we saw in the 1600s, the 17th, 17th century, when these icebergs came down and clogged the mouths of the rivers like the Rhine or the, the Elba and uh, the other rivers of northern Europe were, were packed with uh, not just frozen but with icebergs sticking in their craw. So we're within the band of oscillation. What does it represent, therefore? It is a hysteria of the Anglo-American ruling elite with their typical Malthusian philosophy, Malthus being, of course, the father of Keynes, uh, conceptually speaking, Malthus being the leading ideologue of the British Empire in the 19th century, uh, Malthus being the theoretician who basically told William Pitt the Younger, it's okay, go ahead and let those paupers die. That was the purpose of Malthus's essay. And again, he was a plagiarist. He had no original ideas. Everything he wrote came from the work of Gian Maria Ortes, O-R-T-E-S, of Venice. Look him up. There's an essay by me on the Internet about Ortes. We'll be back in a minute.